the 2022 Makhlouf Haddadin Symposium titled The Art of High Impact Publication, a roundtable discussion about publishing science and more. My name is Elisa Shahid. I recently graduated with a master's degree from the chemistry department here at AUB, and I will be the moderator of this session. I am very pleased and humbled to be sharing the stage with esteemed professors who are editors-in-chief and associate editors of high-impact ACS journals. I would like to welcome our guests in alphabetical order, uh, Professor Prashant Kamat, uh, editor-in-chief of ACS Energy Letters, Professor Terry Auden, editor-in-chief of Nano Letters, Professor Kirk Shanzi, editor-in-chief of ACS uh, Applied Materials and Interfaces, and Professor Hanadi Sleiman, uh, associate editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society. So welcome. Thank you for joining us here in Lebanon and for agreeing to take part in this discussion. Students and young researchers uh, would greatly benefit from this panel, which is the first of its type ever taking place at AUB. They get to hear from the experts themselves how the process of publishing papers goes at the other end. Now, we will begin with short introductions that will be discussed by our esteemed guests. And after that, we will open the floor for a question, for a question and answer session. So first of all, Professor Kamat, in your opinion, what is the best strategy to effectively present one's science, from manuscript preparation to on-point focus for titles, abstracts, and figures? Thank you, Alisa. And uh, thank you, Bilal, and everybody for giving us a platform to discuss some of the issues uh, do it. And some of us who are sitting here, it's not that we are anything better, but we see a lot of manuscripts that's coming in. And the first glance gives you the impression of the entire paper. So what is the most important thing which makes you decide a paper? Anyone? Title. Title is the first one you see and read. Then the abstract, right? So first you have to make it title as short as you can. That should tell us the entire theme of your paper or the major theme of that paper. Then the abstract. The abstract should be written in a broader context. You should have a bigger story, not a only short story, because it has been indexed, it is read by all different people. So make sure that it is, addresses a bigger story, and also make sure that you clearly identify what is the new finding. Investigated, carried out, demonstrated, those are not new findings, those are what you did. New findings is something like catalyst I prepared has selectivity towards this one. So it should stand out at least one or two sentences. And that becomes the theme of your paper. Then the figures. You know, I just wrote an edit editorial calling the lost art of single panel figures. We used to draw only one figure, one panel. Now we have six, 10, 16, 20, we can't even read what's there inside. Those are waste of your time and waste of everybody's time. And you have 20 panels. Nobody is going to look into it. Identify what is that figure that you want to present so that it supports your key findings. Move the rest to the thing, uh, supporting information. So the figures are the most important thing because that's what you all do it. Once you read the title and abstract, you go through the figures for a story. Is that attracts you. So the figures are another gateway. Then you write the story based on the theme that you picked, and you do it. So there will be more points will be coming in, so I will not pass on to the next one. OK. Thank you very much. Professor Adam, will you please share with us how the review process takes place? And uh, what would you comment about the so-called triage? And why would uh, papers just get rejected without even being sent to reviewers? OK, so uh, Prashant told you about uh, the general scope of what a manuscript uh, looks like. And if you're ready, once you're ready to submit it, uh, ACS journals only accept electronic submissions. 
And so you go into this um, program called Scholar One, Paragon Plus, and then you submit your journal. I mean, you submit your article to the journal. Uh, besides the, uh, the manuscript itself, you are, I think it's required to submit a cover letter as well. And the cover letter indicates to the editor in more uh, general, in layman's terms, why your paper is so important. And often the cover letter will help the editors also decide if they want to send it out for, for review. And then you upload all of those things. You get an email that says your paper has been submitted successfully, and then you wait. Um, and sometimes uh, you are assigned an associate editor to handle your paper right away, a couple of days, and other times it's, it's longer. And uh, then the question is, how, does, how do you know, or what are the tips, or why do we triage papers? Um, well, I'll just ask, why would, your, why would a journal ever not send your paper out for review? Novelty, scope, taste of the journal, scope. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, so that's a pr very practical reason. The, the, the community itself is um, it's finite, and we want high quality reviewers to be able to uh, evaluate uh, the papers, and they don't want to look at something that might be lacking in novelty or that's uh, out of scope. Any other potential uh, reasons? Bad composition, it's not readable. <laughs> bad grammar, bad, bad figures, no story. Right, there's a lot of reasons. So the, the point is that there's a lot of reasons why your paper might not be uh, sent out for review. Got it. Uh, okay, so let, let me tell you how, okay, we do, let, me, let, me do your, let me do your second question first, actually, uh, and, but let me tell you how we do it at, at Nano Letters, and maybe other people can chime in, because all the, all the journals are a little bit different based on size. Okay, so at Nano Letters, you submit it. Um, I, as editor-in-chief, read all the manuscripts that come in, skim them very, very quickly. And I write, you know, five to six sentences, my comments, that are included for the associate editor. So the associate editor has my comments, but they're reading. They're the experts in the manuscript. And then they will make the decision. They will either agree with me or, or, or disagree. If they disagree, then we have a discussion and we'll see what happens. Uh, um, so it passes through two editors before it's going to be triaged. Um, oftentimes, uh, ACS is very interested in expanding uh, geographic diversity as well as other diversity factors. And so as part of my comments, um, I note that. Not too many papers from Turkey, you know, not too many papers from pick your country. And, and the reason for that is, uh, at least for nano letters, if the associate editor is reading it, it's just a little bit of a, 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 an encouragement. If it's on the edge, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and send it out for, for review. So if we, have, uh, if we are underserving areas, um, at least for nano letters, that's an advantage for you. Um, in terms of uh, the Nobel Laureate, which is an extreme version with a, a well-known author, right? Someone who's famous. Um, at least in nano letters, we, we still do the two editor process, but um, you think, uh, we don't hold them to, what we should do is hold them to higher standards, but we don't do that. <laughs> we, we hold them to, to the same, and uh, I, we have pre-screened papers from, not a Nobel laureate, at least I haven't pre-screened, well, we don't get too many submissions from Nobel laureates. I'll, we didn't pre-screen Fraser's article, for example. Um, we are waiting for a nano. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and so, there can be this frustration if you're a newer assistant professor and you, and you feel like you're not getting the same preferential treatment um, as uh, some more established investigators. I think it's really the more established versus the, the newer. 
But I think some of that can be overcome by, uh, in your cover letter, uh, just by stating that, yeah. About you talk about the difference between the established and the younger investigator. A lot of times the established <laughs> investigators, groups, they just really know how to put together papers because they have a lot of experience. And it comes back to what Prajant was talking about. It's the title, it's the appearance of the figures, the layout of the paper. So the message to young investigators is do that. Spend a lot of time on it. Make sure it looks good, it, it reads well, and it's clear, and you'll pass through this as long as you fit the scope of the journal. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I think this is part of the discussion. I know we're having an official discussion later, but I think this informal discussion is for sure is a good one. Would you like to add any other point to that? Go ahead and pass it. Okay. On. So now it's uh, your turn. Uh, let's continue. So let's say the uh, paper gets into the review process. Okay, you get the comments of the reviewers. How would you advise the uh, authors of the paper to respond to these reviews? And what should the person do in the opposite case, in case their paper gets rejected? OK, first, in terms of how to handle or respond to reviews, uh, of course, read them carefully. Uh, they, they should help you improve the paper if you uh, look carefully at what the reviewers are telling you, because generally, you can view that as a reading by a person who isn't as familiar with the work as you are. So it's a third person having done a careful read of your paper. Uh, so you should sit down and essentially make a document that has each reviewer comment and then write a response back. What, what have you done to address that comment? And I always advise authors to do the best they can to make adjustment in the paper to address every comment. Don't just write back and say, oh, well, the reviewer didn't understand this. Rather, you need to improve the paper so the reviewer will understand it if they read it again. It's not the reviewer's fault. It's the author needs to make it clearer. Um, and so one of the things that I do find occasionally as an, as an editor is when an author sends a paper back and they're just essentially rebuttaling every comment without making any changes in the paper. And, as an editor, then I view that as a negative uh, sort of response. So be active, make changes in the paper, make a marked up copy of the paper, meaning use track changes in your word processor uh, so that then you can highlight those and, and return that copy to the editor. Okay, I'll so now quickly address the, how do you respond to a, a set of reviews and an editor decision that says no. The first thing is take a deep breath and don't, don't respond until your emotion has, has settled down. And, and I even suffer this myself. The first time I read the reviews, I get angry, you know, because you've spent a lot of time on it. Your students have spent a lot of time on it. So take a quick look, and if it says reject, just put it on your desk and wait a couple of days, and it always works, because within a couple of days, you're you know, your anger or whatever, that negative emotion has kind of relaxed and you can then be objective and go through and read those comments and number one, decide are they valid? Did the reviewers really find things that really are a problem? And if so, and you feel strongly, you might want to send the editor a message and say, I really feel like I can address these comments. I'd like the opportunity to resubmit the paper. So that's always an option. But most authors maybe do that one out of 10 times. You know, most of the time, the best thing to do is to revise the paper and then find another scope appropriate journal to submit the paper to. Uh, so for example, if you submitted it to JAX and it wasn't accepted, then you might consider if it's a, a paper in the field of organic chemistry, submitting it to the Journal of Organic Chemistry, uh, or I'll be uh, equal and say maybe the journal of European Journal of Organic Chemistry. You know, find another scope appropriate journal. But don't submit the paper without addressing the reviewer comments. You still should make revision because that will make the better paper better the next time. And then when you submit it to that other journal, disclose to the author, the editor, in the cover letter that the paper has been submitted to another journal, it was declined, but here are the things that I've done to improve it. We hope that you'll be able to consider it and send it for peer review. Great. Okay. 
Thank you very much. But also just to, to follow up on that, if you stay within a, a publishing house, like for example, within uh, ACS publications, and you do everything that uh, Kirk mentioned, um, we will know that the next journal will have the uh, reviewer information as well, and it can result in an expedited review. Meaning you already made the revisions, you already made the changes. I mean, we've done this at least once or twice, where I will review it uh, as it's after it's submitted, they made all these revisions, and you can just accept it. Um, but if you go outside of the public, if you go outside of the journal home that you've uh, submitted to the publishing, then you're just you're sort of starting all over, actually, because I don't really care if you submitted advanced materials. Who who wrote these reviews? Great. Professor Sleiman, what you know? Some excellent papers receive little citations, while other papers uh, receive much higher citations. What do you think the reason behind this might be? Well, um, first of all, I just wanted to say that the, the, our field or our, our um, institutions are getting further and further away from some new numerical values, for example, H index and uh, impact factor. And in fact, there are some now institutions in Europe that are signing agreements to totally uh, ignore those numbers when they evaluate. So that's, that's put aside. What makes something uh, have higher citation? I think there's a lot of answers to this. So for example, there are some uh, areas of research that acquire more citations, typically some biological chemistry or some biological areas. Uh, some materials area ha are more cited. So you know, even in, in my lab, you know, uh, when we publish a paper on gold nanoparticles, it's really cited. And, you know, I'm equally proud of another paper, and it's not as cited, and that's because it's field dependent. So um, it's not always, you know, hand in hand, the quality of the paper and the number of citations. Now, how do you boost it, right? Um, I, first of all, definitely what Prashant was saying, your title should not be very, uh, um, nitty-gritty, detailed, uh, with lots of uh, technical words and stuff like that. That is definitely the case because it will turn off a lot of people. Your abstract, similarly, I wanted to add to Prashant, if you wanted to have an abstract that, uh, that is uh, meaningful and, and impactful, perhaps you also uh, you know, start by uh, stating uh, the interest. So I'm just going to give you a, a division of an abstract that I really like. Um, you talk about the problem in general, and then you go a little bit into particular, and you define what is the problem in the field that your paper is trying to address. You stick to one story, not two or three stories per paper, okay? Your paper is addressing this problem. You say how you've addressed this problem. That's the third part. The fourth part, the methodology that you used. And then finally, the results at the very end of your abstract and how they impact the field in general. So if you have that kind of thing and then people can read in your abstract what you have contributed to the field, and it's very clear, um, you are likely to be read. Because it's, it's really all about you know the person downloading your paper and starting to read it and saying it's interesting, right? So you get that when you, when you get those two things. So, and then the other thing that, uh, that is now something, especially young people, uh, that is very important, I think, is social media. I think you, uh, you know, don't discount things like Twitter. Uh, there's a huge scientific uh, chemistry community actually on Twitter. It's a very professional community, and there's nothing wrong with, with saying, uh, I just published this paper, this is what I think is really exciting about it, and make it really accessible to a very general audience. That's actually really, really powerful in giving you, uh, uh, you know, people interested in your work. And how? And tag it to the journal, tag it that's to the right, journal. exactly. Yes. I just wanted to say something about Twitter. This morning, Carolyn Bertozzi, I think it's the first time it's ever been done, she gave a point-by-point -point sort of history of what her group did to sort of get to the Nobel Prize. So you might want to take a look at that. It's, it's, uh, it's a nice use of Twitter, I think. Amazing. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to follow up. Oh, how can you comment, or what's your comment about open access journals? How can they impact the 
the paper, the citations on the paper, and the impact factor of the journal in general? Do you want my uh, opinion or my honest opinion? <laughs> With them, um, you're uh, look, I think I think society journals like Chemical Science that are uh, open access are absolutely fantastic. I wish every society had. Uh, Central Science does is like that in the ACS, but I think I wish we had more in the ACS that were completely open access like that. Um, so that's that's fantastic, and that actually will increase your citations. I'm I'm very sure of it. Uh, however, you know, there's the other f flip side of these these journals that are open access and that that charge you close to what seven eight thousand dollars to publish. Sometimes more. Sometimes more. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. My opinion is not. You know, I'm 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 very torn about this because you know some of them are excellent. Like you know, Nature Communications is fantastic, uh, right? And uh, but uh, you know, I I'm just of two minds as to whether this is the right way to actually publish, really. But yeah. Nevertheless, uh, obviously, if you have an open access uh, uh, paper, it's it's more cited. I guess in Europe right now, uh, the, the problem is solved for many organizations because they require it. And I don't know if the, in the US and Canada we're going to start requiring it too. Uh, maybe one day we'll all be open access. I don't know. Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, from a reader's perspective, the open access is very attractive because I can click it and read any paper that I want. But at the same time, now the paywall has, can be moved from reader to the author. Sometimes the institutions, libraries, in Europe, for example, the funding agencies pick up the cost. But in the US, you have either institution, that's it. The funding agency is so far not allowed us to charge it to your grant, unless it is a private foundation. So this becomes a very interesting issue. Suppose if you publish five papers, now you add it up, that's equivalent to one graduate student or a one postdoc. So you would be spending that money on research or publishing papers. That's one aspect. Second aspect to me is it excludes it makes a club. People who can afford, they will be able to publish. There are a lot of countries where they can't even find to get chemicals, there is no money. How can they find money to publish in open access? That is point is not addressed. They say, okay, we'll give you discounts. That's not the way. The second, third thing is the predatory journals. There are a lot of journals with same names have popped out because you can start a new journal and I think we are talking about right one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hypothetical. I'm just saying is people who have computer server, they can just charge it and people have just sting operation. They've sent uh, to, uh, their children's uh, report on penguins. They will publish it as long as you write a check. So where is the quality coming from? So. Again, this is my opinion of three things. Great. Uh, we can start taking questions from the audience. Yes, Dr. Ghattar. Um, once I had a communication accepted in very um, high impact journal. But one of the reviewers said, uh, you have to uh, cite these particular uh, articles. I refused. The editor refused to uh, accept the publication, even though at the beginning he said, I'm, I'm happy to accept a revised. Any comment about this? Yeah, uh, one thing, I don't know which journal it is, but if you send it to ACA journals, editors really appreciate bringing this to the attention. Even in fact, yeah, if you bring it to my attention, that reviewer gets flagged. If he if you ask you to self citations, if one may be okay, but if he got like a series of five, six, he will not get any more papers from us. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's uh, um, 
there is a reason sometimes that they ask for uh, for papers to be cited. Uh, a lot of authors just uh, forget to cite some papers. Sometimes even, you know, they don't forget. They just like conveniently don't cite something. So uh, at that point, I would actually insist to, to have this cited. But if it is a self-promotion, and if the author is telling me why he, he or she thinks that these should not be cited or they're not related, I will respect that, of course. There is also, you may want to look for mega reviewers. These are reviewers, they accept every invitation that comes in, and they do exactly what they said, and to just to raise their H index. So it's called mega reviewers. They review more than 100 papers a year. Hello. So last time I was reading on Twitter some joke taking on. It's about publishing negative results. So just like how we have publications, uh, why can't we start something called Publanions, where we publish negative results? Because sometimes uh, people work on a topic, they don't reach a result. Uh, however, even if we reached a negative result, it might be beneficial for people working on the same topic. So do you think in the near future we might have this Publanions? I should say that uh, there are journals already that will you know, publish work like that. That is, if it's scientifically sound um, and it, you know, there is a result, whether it's positive or negative, but it's a clear result. Uh, you know, often negative results do mean something if they're interpreted properly. Um, an example journal at ACS would be ACS Omega. Uh, it is an open access journal, but it's part of their scope to publish work that's scientifically sound. It doesn't necessarily have to be groundbreaking or uh, impactful in the way that we normally think about it. So, uh, so I think it, you know, consider it. Unfortunately, Omega is open access, so there's, there's the uh, open access fee, <laughs> which Prajant and others have talked about. Would anyone like to add anything? So there's something, Professor. Oh, yeah, oh, no, just a, just a small. There are actually some other journals, like for not from ACS, uh, Journal of Controlled Release, Nucleic Acid Therapeutics, that have that have a campaign for negative results, and they have special issues where people either has have cautionary tales or negative results. So so there is that kind of uh, move uh, in some fields, actually. Thank you. So. One more thing is you can always spin it around and make it a positive story. That means you are studying a mechanism. Suppose your reaction failed. Now you explain why that reaction failed. And that way you can make that is a positive story. And that becomes a very interesting. Thank you. So Professor Kamat, yeah, one second. Professor Kamat gave me these uh, small gifts for anyone who asks a question. So can someone please take them? <laughs> Someone from the team, please. So thank you. Yes. Hmm? Take them all and turn on someone else. Thank you. OK. Other questions? Yes. I'm from the university libraries. And uh, I would like to ask uh, a question about, uh, like you said, uh, that uh, you can share your research through Twitter and link to the full text. But what about copyright? Because uh, do you have uh, the right to share the full text if, uh, the, if it's not open access? No, you don't actually. So you would share a link, but the link, if it's behind a paywall, the people have to actually uh, have access to it. But you don't share the PDF of your manuscript, no. I mean, not, not unless it's open access, of course. I have another question, because in the library we have the institution repository, uh, where we encourage uh, faculty members uh, to submit the, a copy of the research paper to the repository, so other faculty members in the university at least can read it, or uh, it could be archived also in the repository. Uh, what do you think, like how is the best practice when a faculty member is submitting an article to a journal uh, to negotiate the rights to do that, to self-archive in the repository? Uh, I think I think um, this used to be a controversy. In fact, a while back when Chem Archives started uh, uh, JAX, we had a discussion in JAX about this, about the fact that, oh, will JAX accept people that have already submitted an open access Chem Archives or not? 
and the consensus then became that no, we will. ICS journals will accept. I don't know about other journals, but we we accept already things uh, submitted, let's say, to Chem Archives or archives in general. Um, so. Therefore, I, I don't see a problem with this as long as the submission is correct and you're not submitting the final. Uh, you have to. You cannot submit the final, final version, right? Yeah. I was just going to say the best practice, if it's a local repository, is that you should encourage the authors to to deposit the accepted version of the paper. So after it's been through the peer review process and revised. Um, Often the papers that are put on preprint servers have not been reviewed. Uh, but for your internal purposes, it would be best to have the, uh, the accepted version of the paper. Yes, yes it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can make a comment. Um, you know, I think as, um, as scientists, creative workers, uh, we have to view our work as having some value. And SciHub devalues the work that we've done. Um, you know, even though you submit it to a journal and the journal may own the copyright, you still own some rights and have interest in the work. SciHub is basically monetizing your work with no recognition of your contribution. So it's a violation of copyright. So, you know, while it may be something that you find is, a, is great as a, as a reader, think about what you're doing. You know, if you were an artist and you made a painting, you, would, you wouldn't feel good if the whole world could just access it for free. Well, your scientific work is similar to that. So I think we should push back on these, these organizations that are basically pirating our work. Now, it's a different debate to talk about the publishers taking our work, and, but they are adding value. You know, the publishers do add value to our work. It goes through peer review, uh, it goes through copy editing, and the final copy is, is definitely added value. Um, so SciHub is just abrogating all of that. You know, there is nothing free in life, okay? The SciHub is not stupid. They are getting, trying to get access through your computer, through your institutional computer. So when you log in to download something, your computer is compromised, your institutional thing is compromised. And there is a big article in Scholarly Kitchen, you can just type in Sci-Hub, that guy has given you all the codes, what they use to extract the information from you and your institution. Hi, uh, maybe it's a kind of general question. Um, there is a notion, I don't know to what extent it is true, so I want to ask uh, from the expert. Um, ACS journals are kind of relatively easy for Americans, while journals are kind of easy accessible to Europeans, and elsewhere journals are mostly for like GCC countries where they are, I mean institutions are supporting open access fee, generally from the grant. Um, so, to what extent it is true? I need honest answer, though. Uh, I think, you know, I can speak for what I know quite a bit about. Uh, my, the journal that I edit represents about 20% of ACS's submissions. It's a global operation. Uh, the USA is not the largest uh, submitter or publisher of articles in ACS applied materials and interfaces. Uh, Asia is the largest uh, region of, of, of submission, and right now, currently and globally, Asia is the largest uh, output of scientific uh, articles. Um, now, you're correct that ACS journals are not as well represented in Europe in terms of authorship, and, and I think that's a cultural, you know, the communities are a little bit separated, uh, you know, geographically, and we don't interact as much, so that there's a little bit of that separation that appears in the in the published work as well. Uh, but ACS would certainly like to change that. We're very open to having papers coming in from Europe, uh, you know, the Middle East. Um, so please don't feel like there's a bias against you, as uh, Terry mentioned. And another thing you should 
you should notice ACS article formats have changed in the last two years. The author names and their institutions are at the end of the article. And many authors have recognized that. And when they submit their paper, they put the names and the institutions at the end. And think about it. What that means is that when the editor or the reviewer first sees the paper, they don't know where it's coming from. There, it, it helps to minimize this sort of regional bias. Uh, so you might think about that when you're formatting your article. Put, put your name and your institution at the end of the paper, like the way it's formatted, because that, that could help. I want to share a frustration I had when one professor biology background that I was I rejected. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure. Okay, so now it's better. Okay, so I want to share a frustration I had with one uh, paper we submitted to an ACS journal. So it was rejected for one technical uh, part of the technique. But then when we were replying to the reviewer, we used other papers in the same journal that used the same technique, and it was still rejected. So my perspective was like, why did they actually like, you know, is it because, as you were talking about, by, like, I still feel we are biased against, like, because we're coming from the Middle East, they don't trust the paper from where it's coming, or I'm not sure, like, it's, it's or, the, or it's like, it's a biology related, <laughs> Uh, chemistry paper, so they don't like. I'm not sure. Like, what? What did you like? Oh, there's a. Uh, I guess. I, I guess it, it's it's a case by case uh, uh, situation, uh. obviously. Uh, so I don't actually know the the. the uh, but um, for example, for Jacks, there is sometimes a question of scope. So if, for example, a paper is extremely uh, uh, um, targeting an audience that is an audience of physicists or biologists or, you know, uh, that will be taken into consideration, even though JAX is a general, um, but it, you know, it, it looks for articles that are going to be uh, uh, read and uh, appreciated by the, uh, by the general chemistry audience. And so sometimes that actually plays a role uh, in, in this. The other thing I wanted to say is, um, uh, so I don't know exactly uh, your situation. So this may not be an answer to your question, but I've I've gotten some uh, uh, rebuttals sometimes saying, um, how come you rejected uh, our paper? Uh, there's all these other, pa and, and you say the scope is outside. There's all these other papers that were published in JAX that were accepted. And I mean, I don't want to say it, but sometimes you know that the answer would be just because an X number of papers was submitted and accepted in that field in JAX does not mean necessarily that this paper that was submitted meets some requirements. And so, uh, if if you know, rebuttal is a good idea sometimes if you feel very strongly about your paper. But this argument that uh, all these papers in this field have been published in this journal, it sometimes does not work because each one of them is, has a d different criteria for its acceptance. Do you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know. I cannot speak for other ACS journals. We do sp take a rejected manuscript, you can revise and resubmit back again and tell us what new revisions you have made. And most of the ACS journals I know, they do consider it. So don't hesitate. Just because it rejected, don't get disheartened. Again, if you think you are right, prove that you are right, revise it and resubmit back. It will go back to the review. And that's number one. Number two, again, I can speak for my journal. If you have a paper, send it to me. I can tell you how it fits in, how we can improve it so that it fits in the scope of the journal. But for the revised and reject and resubmit, it's by invitation. I mean, so, so don't just revise it and then just resubmit it. I mean, that, that, that manuscript decision is an is a invitation. We take okay. Yeah, what I, I was going to just add to that, please contact the editor before you just resubmit it, because, yeah. So my question is related to how editors deal with the comments of their viewers. Um, how comes that sometimes the three out of three reviewers say that it is, uh, have, the paper has a novelty, 
Um, like uh, they don't comment anything badly about the paper. It's a, type, a couple of typo mistakes or just to replace a figure in a different place. And yet the editor suggests a transfer. And when you click on the transfer link, it goes to an open access suggestion. On the other hand, sometimes uh, when you have uh, one reviewer that is with and one reviewer who is against, you go to um, major revisions. And then you do the major revision, and then you uh, resubmit. Uh, how does the editor view, again, the comments that are completely different from the first round? And is there a minimum or maximum major minor revisions, or simply it doesn't follow a rule? Thank you. I mean, th these are also case-by-case -case, uh, decisions. And so I think that the frustration for, for authors is that if two reviewers recommended publication and then one didn't and then it gets rejected, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, but, but, but we don't work in those. Um, okay, so we take that as a recommendation and it's the editors that make a decision. And so how do we, then the question is how do we interpret what the reviewers are, are saying? So for the most part, I don't look at the, whether they say major revisions, minor revisions. Most of the time it's the comments. So what do the comments say based on what we our understand we, the, our understanding of what you described in in, in your paper? Um, that's one thing. But the other thing is we know who the reviewers are. Some reviewers always write very harsh negative reviews, um, and but we know how to interpret that. And and some people write very positive reviews but say nothing. And so if they say nothing, then that's not helpful for us either. So what the editor is doing is we're integrating all of this information uh, that we have to make a decision. I think that would be, unus that would be unusual. I have never, in my whole time as Jack's editor, I've never had a situation where all three reviewers said no, uh, sorry, yes, and I said no, or even two reviewers saying yes and I say no, um, unless there's a, th a negative reviewer uh, in the three or the two or whatever. But what but, uh, she's uh, saying is that Yeah, I've never had that. Uh, I've never done that. I don't know if uh, other people have, but I've never done that. You mean they, they, they just said that maybe did all, I mean, this is an extreme example, all of the editor, I mean, all of the reviewers could say it's just not novel, and then there's a recommended transfer, or it was just po positive no. reviews, and then? So positive re reviews, and then uh, they might say that there's no more space in our... Uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, so I can, can, doesn't have that. Are we, that's right. Okay. I would definitely say that that would be not the ACS. Just it would be in general. a mistake by an editor so because in that situation, if what you say is correct, the paper should have been triaged and never sent for review because it means that, you know the editor sent it for review and then changed their mind. And I would, if I was the editor in chief, I would go back and tell the editor reverse your decision, so that just wouldn't be fair to an author. Yeah. One more thing is in the ACS guidelines is the reviewer comments are supposed to help make a decision. It is not mandatory that everything is binding. So there are a lot of times editor accept papers with negative recommendations and you never hear about it from the authors. There are a lot of times, there are more papers being accepted with a negative recommendation then rejected with a positive recommendation. Uh, I have a question for you. So how do you decide the, the reviewers on a paper? How, how does the process go to choose these reviewers for a certain paper? Who gets the answer? Mostly, OK, so if it's an area of your expertise, or even if it's not, I usually read through the, um, one of the first things is to read through the references. So what is the work? Who are the authors of the work? that, you know, you, who that, those, uh, the author cited people, and presumably those people are very important in evaluating the, the work. Some of it is who you know, but I mean, that's, that's, that's limited. Uh, but one thing also is if the authors request that we do not submit to specific reviewers, in general, uh, editors will honor that decision, unless they give us 10 people. 
I mean, that's just too many. But if it's one person and there's some reason for a conflict of interest or perceived bias, then we won't, we won't do that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to Terry's comment here. A lot of times, students actually write the references, put the references as an afterthought, and they just uh, uh, either they don't they don't give them as much attention. But remember that the references that you're putting in might be the people that you're going to be uh, that are going to be reviewing your paper. This is very important. I say it to my students over and over again. A lot of times, they're just not paying attention. So, two things. First of all, uh, cite all the work in your area. Do not omit one or two papers just because it's convenient and that makes your work less novel. You're gonna be caught. <laughs> it's, it's gonna happen, it has happened. So uh, cite everything in an honest, open fashion and say what's different between your work and theirs and what do you contribute compared to their work. And remember to be very attentive uh, sometimes it's not out of, uh, sometimes you just don't pay attention and you don't cite somebody. Uh, it, it sits badly if a, rev a reviewer is, is re re you know, reviewing your paper, they've done a lot of really great work in the field and you haven't cited them. Um, you know, and so try to avoid those situations and really pay attention to, your, to how you reference your manuscripts for the students. Do you think that uh, the future of uh, really good science will still come out of academia? Because we're seeing more and more startups like Commonwealth Fusion Systems and DeepMind publishing in journals like Nature and Science. Um, yeah. And uh, a follow-up question. Do you think that in order to publish, one should really have a PhD or an MD? Because I, I'm, I mean, Einstein didn't have any of those when he published the uh, Nobel willing uh, papers. So what's your opinion on that? I guess I would make a, at least this is just my personal opinion and viewpoint from my experience with uh, startups and people working in companies is that the priority is on advancing the technology, getting it to market, which may involve patenting or other things that publishing is secondary. Um, and in fact, sometimes really not a priority at all. Uh, so I, I don't see that changing, uh, at least not near term. That is that most of the published record is still coming from academic and government organizations. Um, let's see, your second question was about, uh, oh, the PhD. Well, there's no requirement for that, you know. <laughs> I mean, um, in fact, I think most of our first authors in most of these journals are students, which they may have a bachelor's degree in most cases, but there's there's no requirement for a degree to publish. So this is, uh, sometimes we do get a graduate student publishing on his own. And single author, just we look into it, who this person is. What we request is either someone attesting that they are supporting that work either a department chairman or a PI. The reason is the students are mobile. Today that address is valid. Tomorrow they will go to some other place and we will not be able to find it. Some problem comes. Then the other reader complains that whatever this guy published has a problem. So whom should we contact, right? For that reason, we need an endorsement, but a student can a single author become a corresponding author and publish. Just to be clear, that's not normal. And, that's not and, uh, and, and there could be flags on that because especially if it's a, an experimental paper, unless they bought everything on their own, did the work in their garage, and didn't use anybody else's resources, then there's not proper attribution for use of uh, Resources and so then I mean I think you're obligated to uh, to include uh, institutions or whoever else uh, finance and support. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean my my point though is that there there isn't a requirement that that person have a PhD. That, that's that was how I was agreeing. But you're right. Yeah, we we need to have an author record. The typical story is the student goes to the PI and says, "Well, I want to publish a paper," and the PI is not ready yet. He says, oh, I put so much effort. Then the PI says, OK, go ahead and publish on your own. And then that guy writes it and submits it.
But I have another question. So sometimes in conferences, there are some roundtable discussions, just like as we are having now, and top-notch scientists, they really share their opinion honestly about something. Let's say yeah, DFT, because I'm interested about it. Or someone addresses a question, what do you think the future of DFT will be at some point? And what do you think about having papers that really list the opinion of these scientists? So, for example, instead of me going to Google and asking what is the FT, I can access this paper and I can see the response of like 100 top-notch scientists about it. You like the question so you can answer it. I mean, it's a great suggestion. Um, you know, th th there are some... some uh, uh, Things like this, for example, there's perspectives in JAX where, but it, it is a single author giving their perspective on a field, uh, and there's equivalent uh, uh, things like this. But I, uh, it's a nice suggestion to have, you know, a journal uh, ask a lot of a lot of uh, experts. Uh, I know Nature Chemistry for one of its. Uh, um, and anniversaries did something like that. What's the future of chemistry? And, and asked uh, hundreds of scientists. But yeah, it's a it's a nice idea. I don't know if you guys have a some um, like ACS Nano has had some perspective type articles with like twenty or forty or sixty or some huge number of authors, um, and I assume that it's an integrated document of what these authors think about a, a new emerging area. So there are, there are things like that, but it's not uh, individual attribution for for what their perspectives are. Yes, Dr. Calhoun. I, I have two questions. First, do you exchange uh, information about reviewers among different journals in ACS? So do you have a database when you flag somebody, let's say, in ACS applied materials and interfaces, then everybody in ACS will know that this reviewer is flagged, whether positively or negatively, if he is too easy or too harsh, or she. I can just say that uh, the, the standard operating procedure at ACS is that the, each journal is individualized, so there isn't database sharing, but the editors do communicate. So, you know, I might send an email to Prajant or my office might asking them for some background on a paper, and generally they will provide that information. But it, there's no requirement. So an editor of another journal could refuse, and the ACS doesn't, doesn't moderate that. What has changed is um, uh, re related to reviewers is, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought that, so we don't ask like the same reviewer, like 10 journals don't ask the same reviewer to review papers. I think that has changed yeah. since I had started. So we do know whether, whether the reviewer has papers from other journals. Currently, they don't tell which journal. Number, you know, like they will say uh, zero dash two. Zero means zero from your journal two from other journal. So then you don't assign that one because he already has two. But uh, there is no direct, uh, I cannot access reviews or manuscript information from any other ACS journal. It's only that specific journal. But within the same journal, uh, you can access other other uh, editors, uh, reviewers, and you can get an, a, a little bit of knowledge of the quality of that reviewer. Uh, in ACS and the, in JAX, we we have a, actually even a grading system. Uh, there's just two questions asked. I don't know if you guys have the same thing. We have a grading system. One is uh, was the reviewer uh, late or early in, in in giving their review back, and the other one is what was the quality of the review? Was it uh, adequate? Was it really good? Was it uh, so? It's it's a very rough uh, number, but you know, I mean, it, it go, like the highest is three, the lowest is one. So you know, often when you look at somebody who has a one. You start looking, you know, you don't, you don't send this very them. much to them anymore. Yeah, if you want to get out of the reviewer, then they're <laughs> uh, If you allow me another question. How do you deal with disputes between, disputes between authors, um, let's say about the order of authorship or removing an uh, author? I, I know about adding an author, I don't know about removing an author. I, I know adding an author, you request actually, I'm looking at uh, Kirk because okay. we had that with the uh, ACS Applied Material Interface. We needed more experiments, and then another author was added to our 
paper and we received that you have, we need to receive acceptance from every one of the authors that you are okay that you add. Uh, I'm not sure about other journals. I think that's now standardized yeah. across yeah. all of ACS. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what about um, publishing something and then somebody was not listed as an author while he should be listed an author and if he brings it to the attention of the journal that I have contributed to this work and my name is not on the paper, how do you deal with that? Institution. Yeah. The institution decides. That's if both of them are in the same institution. Yes. You well, we're out. talking about international collaboration. We're talking about other collaboration. Somebody from here and somebody from another institution and that person published and did not list the person who's here, for instance. How then, do you do that? Then your institution should contact the other institution. So uh, journals are not going to take the sites. I mean, the way to think about it is that the editors have no way of knowing who did what. Only the authors do. And so it has to be up to the authors and their institutions to resolve. And as a corollary, if you're starting a collaboration, I think the best thing to do is as you're starting it, you negotiate authorship and you negotiate who goes where, and especially for your students, because that's really, like for us, right, as for corresponding authors, it's not as important as for the students who are doing the work. So you negotiate on their behalf, as you might know, of course. article it points out some of the problems how the person got didn't get authorship and then how he becomes smarter and then it's, it's, it's a nice article sure I go ahead okay. um, I have a question and a concern at the same time and basically it has to do with bluffing in science so many times um, uh, there's some bluffing in a paper and it gets published in somehow good journals. And I feel like this has impact on students who are first embarking on their, let's say, graduate studies or stuff like that. So it's really important to tackle this thing. So my question is what happens in this case? Like, let's say, sometimes it's hard to detect this. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it's easily detectable. So let's say, should the person who finds that you know, the argument is not strong enough or not valid enough, should they contact the journal or what happens in that case? I think I don't understand. I don't think I understand the question. The maybe it's like incorrect in the oh, false or inaccurate information or. Uh, well, I think it depends. Actually, there's not a lot that the, the the. So unless it's something that's fabricated, where the article can be retracted. Um, sometimes there can be an addition and correction if it's within the, the article, but if something is, is really wrong, I mean, even if you just, unless you want it re retracted, I mean, you can't just like resubmit the yeah, but, but article. What, so we, we get this pretty often. Uh, what the best practice is, if you as a reader find something that you think is incorrect or wrong, write to the editor, and usually what our office does is then we ask your permission to forward that to the author. And so it will go to the author. Uh, and having the editor send it to the author puts a little weight on it. But we still can't, comp once the paper has been reviewed and published, the only recourse is, as Dr. Odom indicated, addition and correction, which means that the authors could submit a subsequent article or short article that corrects what's wrong, or they could retract the paper if it was just completely wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, but I can just tell you, two weeks ago, one of my students presented a paper in our group meeting, and there was something wrong in it. And I immediately wrote the author and said, this is wrong, and I haven't followed up to see if they've corrected it. I hope they have, because it, it was a pretty egregious error. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like just to ask a question regarding the rate of uh, acceptance in uh, top journals. Usually, by the end of every year, uh, the editor of a journal uh, publish like the rate of acceptance over the year. Let's say 2022, 
it is 15% or 12% of the uh, submitted papers. So is this rate uh, a fixed rate by the, uh, by the journal? So if, for example, we have 15 this year and next year it is 20, so then, oh, 20 is too much, so we have to come back a little bit to, so then this will increase the rate of rejection as well. So is this something that you, uh, you discuss among uh, the American Chemical Society? No. I mean, some, sometimes that would happen in other journals, uh, like the Baby Nature journals. Like, they're fixed. Yeah. They're only going to, say, publish 10 articles per, per month. And so then that will, that because of the print issues or whatever they've decided. But for uh, the ACS publications, there's, there's nothing fixed like that. There, there's no page limit. That's right. No page, yeah. yeah. And I'd like to add the other thing that, that we always talk about among our group of editors is that we look at each individual paper on its merit. You know, whether it's suitable for the scope, whether it has some novelty, there's something new about it, and then how does it do in peer review? Every single paper. The number that comes out at the end of the year for the accept-reject ratio is just sim simply a collation of the integration of all those decisions. You know, each paper is evaluated on its own merit, not we're going to only accept one out of four, and so this is the one. There's nothing like that that goes on. I have another question. Uh, is there any follow-up on the rejected manuscript? For example, let's say one manuscript was rejected by uh, your journal, and then after, let's say, six months or eight months, this manuscript has been accepted in another journal, and to start gaining top citations. So what will be your uh, opinion about this? Well, we just yes. had a whole session on this. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, you know, the, we don't track individually like uh, any of us, but the ACS publications, their main office, they keep track of it, and then they tell us, okay, these are the papers you rejected, and these are published, so, uh, that sort of indirect pressure on us to be more uh, inclusive in the sense that uh, doing it. So there is, again, you should take into consideration publication is a transformative uh, thing. What has happened 10 years back is not happening now. As we speak, whatever we are telling now, in the five years, this is obsolete. Something else will come. So things are changing rapidly. So now the authors, the publishers, they want to publish more because more you publish, it's more money for them. I'm talking about every publisher, okay, not the ACS, so in general. So again, this is a changing dynamics. Uh, but one thing I always suggest is uh, don't make it as a template paper. You know, just uh, for example, like uh, especially uh, people like to copy Exactly like that. Figure one is uh, SEM image or TEM image, then one XRD, then XPS, then some property. So those are like a template papers, again, in one specific area I'm telling you. So that one doesn't stand out. Make your story stand out. Something new so that it's broader appeal. I just wanted to add something about uh, uh, your question and also the question of uh, Bilal. Um, Every journal has had a very big push into diversity and inclusion. We're all trained uh, as much as we can be trained on, on, on being a, a lot more in inclusive, and it keeps on happening. And then also, if you see the editors that are appointed, uh, they, they are much more representative now of the world. Like, for example, in, in JAX, you know, there's editors from China, there's editors from India, there's, you know, um, I'm not, I'm from Lebanon, right? Or Canada. Uh, so essentially, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the, the landscape is changing and it's becoming much more inclusive of the entire world. And um, a lot of times, as, as was said, we, we love to hear from you know, countries that are underrepresented, and we love to champion that kind of research. So just, just to say that there is, it's the opposite of bias. In fact, we would like to include more of, of, the, of the work of uh, underrepresented countries and uh, areas. 
Yes, my question is, is nothing to do with as an author, but as a reader. Do you think language and presentation is taking over science? Because sometimes we see, when I read many articles, it's like uh, old wine in new bottles. And sometimes, you know, little bit rearrangement. And uh, uh, we see uh, people are publishing similar articles in top journals. And uh, mostly the fancy language, fancy wording. All these are we are seeing more often now in science rather than actually creativity and something what a scientist should focus on. And we are encouraging our students to focus more on the presentation, more on the language skill, rather than actually creativity. So what is your take on it? I, th I think part of, I might be misinterpreting your comments, so let, let me know if I am, but I was having this discussion at lunch today, um, and uh, I think it depends on where you want to send your work. If you want to send it to a broad general journal, then it has to be written in a way such that uh, the general readership can at least have an opening to at least scan your abstract, for example. Uh, versus uh, if you're, okay, I'll just pick on PCHEM because we're very bad at this. So a physical chemist can rarely get published in JAX, which is the general journal. And, and the reason for that is physical chemists write in this very particular way, where it's highly technical, super narrow, they don't give background on why you should care about the work, but it's very sound. And it's excellent physical chemistry work. But the, gen the average reader in JAX is not going to appreciate that. And it's not written in a way that, um, that the general journals take it. And so it's, it's actually better for a specialized journal, um, like a physical chemistry journal. But are you talking about that the language is just not uh, technical enough, or it sounds very fluffy and very, I mean. I, I think uh, no new science coming up. They spin around the same ideas and trying to uh, put in a new box, give it a nice uh, uh, gift wrap, and then publish in a journal. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, but you know, the things, if you look into the literature, every 25 to 30 years, uh, it repeats, okay, the field. Uh, for example, graphene oxide was done in 1956, right? Nothing happened, but all of a sudden, it just, boom, came up. Uh, same way with photo, any field you take. The reason is there are new techniques available, new mechanisms, so there is more support comes in. So for anybody looking for new ideas, please read back 30 years back paper. So you <laughs> Thank you. It's the inclusiveness that triggers my question. Does any of you as editors or chief editors or reviewers gets affected by the economic boycotts that we see around the world? Conversely, do you feel that authors from boycotted countries are inhibited from submitting their research to your papers either? Uh, so first, let me just say that um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as an editor, not, not a publisher. Uh, but it's my understanding that the publishers in the United States have to follow laws. And for example, if a country is under economic sanction or s some sort of legal uh, rule that the US government makes, then the, the publisher has to follow that rule. And so there are specific conditions where authors of a certain country might be prevented from, from publishing in, in a journal that's published by the American Chemical Society. That's pretty limited, that the restrictions are quite limited. Uh, beyond that, you know, the scientific community is open. And so, you know, routinely, just as an example now, we get routine submissions from authors in Russia. And, and I know that they have concern that there may be some bias against them. And, and just as uh, Professor Sliman just indicated, 
we, if anything, we go the other direction. We really try hard to make sure that there isn't a bias against those authors that has something to do with politics. That, that's not part of our science. Any other questions? Okay, until uh, the microphone gets there, I have a question. So I noticed from your talks yesterday and today that some of the uh, citations that you included as references for your own work are uh, actually submitted or published from the journals where you are editors in chief. So how would you like to comment on that? That's a very good question. The question is, uh, as an author, you should not exclude from publishing our own journal. That's number one. And if it is something very important work, I want to see that work in my journal. And why should I publish in JAX or uh, AMI, right? So that's one thing. Having said that, when I submit the paper, I get totally blinded. I don't see that paper. I don't see the reviewers. Nothing I can see when I log in. So it is totally blinded. And believe me, our paper gets rejected from our own journal, too. And I think, at least from, from my case, uh, it's, it's, it's a higher bar for my students. Like, they're like, oh, let's submit to nano I was like, no, 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 I don't think it's at the level of nano <laughs> And then I get these other papers that I send out for review, and I was like, oh, maybe I should have submitted our own work to nano But yeah, so we, we sort of raised the bar for, for ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. So my question now is a bit different. Uh, let's say uh, I want to switch career to writing. I want to apply a job at your journal. Can you hear me now? Or? Okay. So what's your uh, we requirements? Can you please? Okay. So if I want to pursue a career in writing and science, and I want to apply it for a job at your journal, what are the requirements that you look for, and any advice that can you give, like? So ACS publications, we as editors, we don't hire people, but the publisher does. And they, ACS publications actually routinely, actively hires people globally. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, keep an eye on job listings. Uh, and if you don't know where to find them, you could send an email to me or any editor, and they can direct you. Uh, the requirements typically for for working for a publisher in science is probably a PhD in science, unless you have considerable experience or a degree in, uh, you know, uh, editing or you know, sort of a, a supporting supporting uh, career, maybe library science or something like that. But most of the staff at ACS Publications are PhD chemists, and and that's probably you know nearly a requirement. But then beyond that would be an interest beyond science uh, in scientific writing or publishing. Um, and so if you have that interest, it, it's definitely a career option for, for young people. And, and not only ACS, you know, uh, the other publishers, Royal Society employs many scientists. Wiley, I'm sure, does as well. And then also the Nature and, you know, Elsevier's, they, they all employ uh, PhDs in all the fields of science. Just to add that you might know this, but uh, the ACS, uh, the editors in the ACS are actually uh, usually academics. But for example, Wiley, the editors are actually professional editors. And those, so this is actually another career path that, that somebody who is interested in this kind of thing can have. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be a PI, for example, to be an editor in Nature or to be an editor in Wiley, et cetera. Just a, a follow-up on, on that. It, so th there's a difference between being a, an editor and being a science writer. So if you're, if you're interested in like taking a finding and then converting it to more lay language that can be understood by, say, a broader scientific community, you know, nature and science and all these other publishing, they, they have these types of, of articles. Or if you want to write for uh, a newspaper, you know, science writers take general, you know, top, top specialized topics and make it gen for a general audience. But science writing is different from, from editing. Yeah. 
So I've noticed uh, that a lot of top scientists, not a lot, there's one specific that comes to mind, but uh, she always puts her husband on her papers, and similarly, and they are both in two separate, completely fields. Uh, how do you deal with such scenarios? Uh, because it's obviously unethical, and there is obviously no contribution. Professor. I mean, the scientist herself does not really know the science. I mean. I mean, I wanted well, to I answer mean, it because I know that your husband uh, is a chemistry are. professor, but I don't know about <laughs> the others, so that's why I wanted to answer. Not, <laughs> I didn't know that was possible, so yeah, now, it, I, now it, I know. It is possible. You know? <laughs> but uh, no, uh, no, I mean, this is, total, this is unethical and uh, um, should not be acceptable, obviously. You know, there should be a significant contribution. Some journals now actually require you to write precisely what contribution each author has uh, to the paper, and you're, you're held to it. But yeah, of course. But there are cases where it might not be unethical. And I had a colleague whose wife, they worked together. Um, she didn't do any experimental work, but she wrote a lot of the papers. And so you could envision a situation where somebody, a significant other, uh, maybe is in a different field, but is a very good writer and, and can make a very substantial contribution to editing or even composing an article. So I think just. You know, so without more information, it might be difficult to judge whether it was ethical or not. As a kind of related but far away follow up, um, how about what do you comment on writers contacting or authors doing the work and contacting uh, highly cited um, professors or very well known professors asking for their name to be on the paper without actually doing anything or any contribution? Uh, but I think the real person will not accept that offer because unless your contributions, even sometimes my own postdocs and things, if they have generated ideas and they have flourished, I said you publish independently. That's one. And the second thing is, it's more than the spousal thing or a significant other, is the institutional directors at some of the institutes, they demand their name from all the people in the thing. So that is more problematic, and it, we cannot solve that problem. They have to be it's solved by the institution. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, now the next thing is coming up with dogs and cats, their pets. They think they give, inspire them to do work. <laughs> people, are, people are trying to sneak in. You hear sometimes. Yeah, actually, I just want to point out ACS has a set of ethical guidelines, which uh, among the things there, first it says, who is an author? Number, it's point number seven, I think, in the ethics. Uh, who is an author? An author has made a significant contribution and accepts responsibility for the work. And next it says, an administrative relationship does not imply co-authorship. And then you have to check the box that said, I've read the ethical guidelines. It, have you guys read the ethical guidelines? Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is an answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, any uh, one more question? We only have time. Okay, so I'll ask that question, and I'll ask it. Do you have a question? Sure, sure. No, it's fine. I, I'll ask mine after. So, um, I'm just. So, I once relatively recently reviewed an article um, that was a review for Science. Um, it was rejected. It came back to me to re for a review about six months later. It got rejected again. It went to Nature, it got rejected. I also reviewed it, it w I got rejected. It went to Nature Chemistry, JAX, and Angavant, and somehow I kept getting this paper back. I don't, this is a very interesting scenario. But my question based on this is that creates a huge burden on the community and obviously on you guys as well as editors. But is there any reason why somebody shouldn't do that with their papers? 
beyond the fact that it makes a delay in it, is there any real outcome of just taking every paper we put and put try for the best journal, even though it creates a huge burden on you guys? Well, I mean, I can, my personal opinion is, is that I want to see my work published as soon as possible. And that's certainly not an efficient use of anybody's time, because every one of those submissions took time to go through and do it. Uh, so it, it's, to me, it's illogical. Uh, and I would hope that other people would think that way, but obviously there's some that don't, or maybe they have an assistant that's doing this submission for them. And that's also technically forbidden. Uh, because the authors are supposed to be the submitting agents, not, not a surrogate. Um, so anyway, that's my take. Uh, but it's just, it happens. I mean, uh, we have, I handle papers or I have students, we submit to Journal X of higher impact, it gets rejected, and then we and many other people go down the list. Not my, and, and I would say this is important for my foreign students, um, especially in Asia. Um, so it, they're, rank, they're graded ba based on how many papers do they have, what journal impact factors do they have, and if we actually don't try, even if it results in a delay because it's their career, then, then they don't have a chance. And so this is the terrible thing about that. We want the work to, to get out, but for their, an investment in the future, this is sort of the, the trade-off that we have to always discuss. I'm sort of sad about that, but that's... I was just going to say I'm also very sad about that because yes, there is there's this big burden on on our community from authors that just you know start they don't self-select so I mean we have been taught to self-select we have a paper it it fits in this journal it does not fit in science and nature we know that we tell our students whatever but then there's all these pressures these external pressures that make people now you know throw their paper at every journal and then make us work very hard and so i i i know exactly yeah <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a tough one but the perspective is is that there are some places cultures where that's something that they have to live with this pressure right so so as a conclusion i'd like can, to can we ask questions too would you like to ask questions? Yeah, I can ask questions. Would you like to be a 10th author in a nature journal versus first author in JAX? Yeah. OK. So this is the message for everybody is try to be the first author. It doesn't matter. If you are a 10th author, you may be just turning off the light and every day, and you may be getting a name. Thank you. So my last question is uh, to you, Professor Kamat. So I, ha I heard once uh, Professor Kafarani was telling me that you are able to predict the uh, impact factor of a journal at a certain point in time, or at any point in time. How can you do that? You know, th these are the things you can always, uh, somebody was asking about acceptance rate, right? You can figure it out for at least ACS journals. Because there is a, the last DOI digits are the manuscript numbers. So you can go into December, or if it's June, just multiply by two. It gives you the total number of submissions for the journal. Go to uh, Web of Science and see how many papers they published. That gives you the ratio. Otherwise, typically, publishers will not tell you this acceptance rate, right? But you can figure it out. Same way citations that come in. So typically, Web of Science collects uh, papers uh, until about February. So that is the cycle you have. And you see it's September now. So you multiply whatever citations divide by the number of papers with the factor is 9 months, 9 by 12, or 12 by 9. It is approximate, OK? So. Thank you very much. But lately, they have changed it. They have put early views, and that is confusing a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you, esteemed professors, again for joining us here in Lebanon and for agreeing to be part of this discussion. Uh, with this panel, we conclude the 2022 Makhlouf Haddadin Symposium, which was turned into a memorial symposium after the passing away of the late Professor Haddadin. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>